Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to thank everyone for uh, joining our session uh, today. My name is Ruba Darwish. I'm going to be the moderator for the FinTech session. I want to just thank initially Arab ICT Union for this great opportunity uh, for showcasing uh, the leading women in the tech field. And, and today uh, we're going to also introduce uh, the leading women in FinTech in the, um, in the Middle East. So uh, prior to uh, starting, I just want to, there are a lot of um, discussion about what FinTech is, what FinTech means. And I'm going to give you actually um, a definition, but prior to giving you a definition, I want you to all imagine with me that you're walking in a mall, you see a car, a car has a QR code, you scan your mobile, you use your mobile to scan that QR code, you immediately get all the information related to that car, you immediately get all the financial options that you want. And you can just, with a click of a button, you can actually apply for a loan, get immediate approval on that loan and own that car on the spot. So this is in a, in a very simple uh, manner what FinTech is all about. FinTech is about much easier financial transactions, services, bringing technology into this world where we can actually integrate everything to make our lives better. If you look at definitions, definitions are much more than that, but I like to always make it more practical and showcase that technology is used to make our life easier. Technology is used to simplify the way we do things. Technology is used to bring people more services, uh, enhance our lifestyles, give us more options that are more uh, orchestrated towards our own behavior, our own um, uh, financial needs. So not everyone is the same and technology is able to cater for that. Um, in the Middle East, we've found a lot of changes uh, across uh, the financial services or FinTech. We've found new companies pop up. Uh, we found banks transforming, telecom transforming. So today we are here to highlight uh, the different aspects that we've witnessed in the, globally and in the region uh, with our uh, panelists. So um, allow me uh, to uh, kickstart uh, our session today uh, with having our panelists introduce themselves. So I would st uh, start with Zain. Um, Zain Malhas, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Ruba. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. I'm really honored to be uh, alongside our um, uh, women uh, leaders today um, in fintech and otherwise. Um, I, I am Zain Malhas. I am the currently I'm the chief digital officer of Capital Bank of Jordan, uh, soon to be the CEO of the Neo Bank. We are uh, launching within the next um, couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, I have 15 years of experience and in my prior life, I was a corporate banker and I stumbled upon digital. I went from corporate banking to transaction banking and then from there to products and channels. And in today's day and age, product is all about digital. So it was the natural progression. Um, it, it, there, there was a lot of growth involved in, in this for me because it was not easy to break free from being a traditional corporate banker moving towards what today uh, uh, banking looks like. Um, thank you again, and I'm really excited for this session. Thank you, Zain, thank you so much. Uh, Dina, we move on, move on to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with my fellow colleagues also on the same panel. My name is Dina Shoman. I am the co-founder of Verity the App, which is a fintech startup based out of the UAE. It's a family banking and financial literacy app for children between the ages of 8 to 18. Uh, we basically give them a prepaid card and money management app for them to learn the value of money. And we're hopefully launching in the next few weeks and then expanding into the different countries in MENA. My background is in banking. I have about 10 years of experience in banking, and I've been working in financial education for children and young adults now for over seven years with my first startup that was uh, in New York, which incorporated experiential and play-based learning curriculum, delivered as subscription boxes. And then I moved back to Jordan and through my company, Nahji, did customized projects for banks and nonprofits. And now I am with Verity since the beginning of last year. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. And last but not least, of course, Maha, we move on to you. Thank you, Raba. Uh, first, I would like to thank you and the organizers for such forums 
and it's actually my pleasure being part of it. Uh, partly, of course, uh, being along uh, this uh, panel and, uh, and all ladies uh, in this forum. And actually, uh, uh, also uh, in support of such forums, because I do believe that this is uh, one of the main important channels to reach women and uh, simplify matters, support them and uh, ch channel them in the right direction, especially in the fintech world, because it's a, it's a new field and especially in the digital payments. My background, actually, my name is Maha Saeed and uh, I worked in the banking industry for like 25 years. I, I moved to uh, gate to pay first uh, as a board member in the establishment of gate to pay it's a fintech company. And I was very lucky actually to, to be part of that and move to be the general manager of this company. Uh, my move actually from such a long uh, banking uh, experience to this, because in my heart, I truly believe this is the future and uh, it's all about FinTech. It's all about going into digital payments in the future. And another main part actually, because uh, I do believe this whole uh, space is an enabler for different uh, uh, businesses in micro and in SMEs especially, and women. So being in this uh, company is also gives us the pleasure to be an enabler to, to the society and this space. Thank you. Thank you, Maha, and thank you for highlighting the part for um, uh, where women come in, because one of the key focus areas of, of this event and this panel is to show women the opportunity to show women that what, at whatever age you are, you can always kickstart your business. Today, technology is definitely an enabler and it can help you move forward wherever you are residing, a rural area or you're sitting in a capital anywhere in the world. Uh, then you are able to use technology to really start your business and fulfill any dream that you might have. So um, now, as a, as a fun start to our uh, session, I'd like to introduce our first poll. I appreciate if everyone um, can answer the first question. You will have all one minute to answer. So I'm launching the poll now. So I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. I think everyone is almost done. There are no more changes on the answers or percentages. OK. Done. Let me share the results so everyone can see them. So uh, the question was, how much do you trust digital adoption, especially in financial transactions? We had three answers. I don't, I still go and pay everything in person. I do, it changed my life. I do everything from my mobile, 50%. I, have, uh, I still have concerns, I'm more bound to be hacked. So uh, the highest percentage was the second, 58%, which is actually uh, great and uh, followed by 50%, uh, they still have not 100% trust, they have concerns and of course that's understood. And the third one is, no, uh, they didn't yet use it with 17%. Uh, so I'm gonna um, stop sharing. So uh, ladies, I'm sure these polls are gonna give you just a little bit of uh, flavor of how people look at FinTech and FinTech services and adoption. And I'm going to start with my first question. Maha, my first question is to you. If we look at our lives like five years ago and compare it to how we are living our lives today, we, re we realize that massive change has actually uh, undergone, especially in the financial world. Um, in this age, our mobiles have become mainstream, like they're a bank in our pocket. So would you please share your views on how mobile payment has become a mainstream and what did really cause uh, this change? Thank you, Maha. Thank you, Riva. 
Uh, yes, I actually do believe that. Um, there's a lot of reasons, of course, uh, for, for that. Um, I believe, first of all, um, smartphone penetration is a very major aspect. In the world, we have 92% of populations owning a mobile, whereby 86% have smartphones and 88% have access to internet through the smartphones. And this in itself drives individuals to, to use the mobile as a mean of payments or a digital payment, whether banked or unbanked, because it's an easy way uh, to, to adopt this. In, in, in another aspect, it's a very simple tool and cost effective uh, because the enrollment is very easy at, at one part. It's, uh, it saves for people the, the cost of travel and going to, uh, to a bank or an outlet or an exchange house or anywhere. And of course, uh, it goes beyond the borders of the country. You can do transactions across borders. It's a, uh, it's a very fast means, convenient mean. And also it has a very high privacy tool, which tackles a lot of areas, especially for women. Another aspect is actually uh, the adoption and the higher rates of adoption because of the young generation. And as we move forward, we will see that, that the curve will also go higher and higher because the younger generations will, will assist in that because of the easy uh, accessibility and the use of the different uh, digital payments. Also, of course, and mostly no geographical barriers, whether in the same country or outside. So yes, uh, of course, I do believe uh, that it's changing our lives. And uh, one of the factors that I feel uh, in these two years, unfortunate, or maybe you know, the only aspect, the good side of COVID is basically uh, the higher adoption and the learning curve went from one part to the other. People had to learn how to use this, whether for their uh, cashless uh, transaction, uh, whether for uh, the support and aid they were, they were given from government. So uh, much uh, faster adoptions uh, were because of Corona and hopefully uh, as we are moving out of it, uh, this will continue because the learning curve was very important. I feel these are the main aspects that I would like to share. Thank you. So ladies, uh, just as a, a question to all of you, uh, having looked at the polls, did you expect this feedback? I'd like just to hear a, a quick feedback from um, uh, all of you, just a, a uh, comment. Maha, since you're unmuted, we'll start with you. Actually, yes, uh, because uh, if you see the data and the statistics uh, in, the, in the region today, even not only in Jordan, you see that even for people who are not using uh, like digital, digital and mobile wallets, they are aware of it. So uh, we are in the right direction, at least like there's 95% from the uh, previous statistics that shows people are aware of it. So more and more, the trust factor will kick in and more and more, while once you use it, you see that it's a credible uh, angle that you can actually use for your uh, payments and financials. Great, Dina would like to hear a quick insight from your side. Yeah. Um, yes and no, and also I would be curious to see the age range of the participants, right? Because I still feel the sense of the older generations are still not as trusting in, in such technologies. Um, but it's really great to see. And I think also the topic of, of today is really with people who are interested in the topic. So maybe that also skewed it a little bit. <laughs> uh, perfect. Thank you, Dina. Zayn, please share with us your uh, thoughts. Yeah. I was actually about to, uh, to say what Dina said. It really depends as well on the, um, um, on the, the attendees. So it depends on, again, as Dina, as, uh, Dina mentioned, uh, being... Uh, uh, attending a, a fintech uh, uh, session means you're, you're probably interested in this so you're more tech savvy and um, you're more uh, you're, you're less intimidated by technology so you're okay to adopt technology however in general um, if you just normalize age and and and, uh, and all other factors it does make sense that you would have something in the range of 50 percent adoption perfect so yeah i um I hope that people stop getting intimidated from technology. Again, I, I always say it, and I like to always repeat that. I, I personally believe technology is hope 
uh, technology is our future. Technology provides us with uh, provides us with opportunities that we've never ever had before. So uh, please go ahead, uh, ladies and men out there, and use uh, tech more. So Zane, my next question is uh, for you. Um, every day there's a new buzzword, right? It's in, in tech and in fintech, um, and in fintech especially. And nowadays, every day something new pops up. Uh, yet some of these words have become core to the transformation of uh, banks, banking services, and what they're offering to their clients. And I'm very glad that we have you as the upcoming CEO of uh, one of the first neo banks, I believe, even in the region, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so would you care to share with us the importance of digital banks and the impact of omnichannel on the customer experience and the critical uh, uh, and critical importance of it. Like, why is omnichannel that important? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep my next part, uh, part of the question till after you answer this one. Please of go. course. It's, this is actually a very, um, um, very interesting and important question, uh, Ruba. And it, somehow it goes without saying, but we don't necessarily know why. So there is, uh, there is digital adop adoption, and we do see banks riding the wave because they have to. It's no longer. Um, it's no longer something we, we need to consider whether or not we should do. It's something it became a, a must. And the reason being is the ever-changing needs of consumers. So um, if we look at the main factors being, of course, um, uh, technology on one hand and the pandemic, as you rightly mentioned. Um, and and um, we are also seeing different trends in, in how th these needs are changing and how consumer behavior is changing. So there's a lot of research recently on, um, on why, these we, why we are seeing difference in behavior, why are uh, needs changing and how are they changing? So customers today are no longer just um, happy to find some uh, uh, services and running after what is what they like more, they are now demanding a certain level of, of service. Uh, they are now uh, less loyal to, to brands. So switching cost, costs are much less. So today we find that um, uh, customers look at, are looking for convenience. They're looking for a much higher level of personalization. They are looking for everything being instant. So nobody's willing to wait, as well as transparency and social responsibility and finally low cost so these forces uh, are driving us to 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 digitization because you can achieve such these needs you can meet these needs with the, with digital services excellent thank you so then the second part of my question everyone i think well from my experience uh, minimum i'm just going to say 70 percent think digital banks are neo banks and neo banks are digital banks and they don't really understand the difference between um, both terminologies and what they refer to so would you please uh, yes. clarify that actually i've been um, on a hunt for 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 the past year and a half looking for clear definitions on so many buzzwords being used today so we have um, floating terms like neobanks, challenger banks, payment banks, fintech, digital banks. And uh, technically, they all they are interchangeably used and it depends really where you're reading it. So it depends on the context. Um, you might come across a press release for a fintech uh, in a very specific target with a specific target market offering a very focused value proposition and they would still call themselves a neobank uh, even if they, they are not... Um, necessarily offering banking services. It's, the, it's really um, um, a, a huge mess, if I can say, for the lack of a better word. Um, the way I, from my personal, this is my personal take on things and from my personal readings and, and, and research. Um, so uh, did, we need to first uh, um, uh, isolate digital enablement from digital banks, because today, uh, traditional banks, as I mentioned, are forced to ride the wave and they are all investing in becoming more digitally enabled. They are offering digital solutions to their customers, um, all sorts of, uh, of solutions, including omni-channel experience and all of, all of that. Um, if we isolate this and we look at digital banks, they are today uh, um, coming up as new banks. Um, we have uh, neo banks and we have challenger banks. The differences that I have come across are three um, main differences. One relates to licensing. The second one relates to uh, physical presence and the third one to the value proposition. So neo banks are not licensed. 
they are uh, separately licensed. They typically have incumbent banks that are supporting them uh, in the background with their license. They are um, they do not have physical presence, so they are usually digital only. And their value proposition is quite focused. Challenger banks, on the other hand, are separately licensed, so they are uh, actually applying for digital banking licenses. They 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 might have physical presence. It's not it's not necessarily just digital. And they have full-fledged banking services, so they are challenging the traditional banks. This is not conclusive. Again, these terms are being used interchangeably. The concept is, at the end of the day, is delivering value to customers by digital services. That's the end result. Okay, perfect. And I think, in general, with all the new concepts, there are no uh, definite definitions. There yes. Because... Technology is changing every day, so new concepts pop up and change the existing concepts and so forth. So, but thank you very much uh, for the uh, insight, Dina. Um, moving, uh, moving to you. Um, there were a lot of um, things uh, that people or like um, uh, companies looked at is like why are banks transforming? What's causing the, this this move from like the traditional approach? One of which, of course, the, all the fintech services that are popping up globally. We look maybe at Amazon, ANT Financials. We look at Facebook. But one of the key uh, driving uh, forces to push banks to change is the youth and the gig economy, the, the startups, uh, the digital uh, services that they need uh, or the generation Z that, uh, needs. So would you please um, let, put your insights into, is it still important to incorporate the concept of uh, financial services, the concept of FinTech, the concept of these uh, new pop-ups into the educational sector or is it you know, we don't need to focus much on that because by default, Generation Z already knows all of these concepts. And I'll leave also my second uh, second part of the question till later. Sure. So I don't think that banks or even we as businesses and fintechs and, and even as parents really have a choice, right? Financial technology products, as everyone has been saying, has become developing and is becoming a fact in our day-to-day -day lives. It's giving us more options and digitizing almost everything, uh, which makes our lives easier. But I think that just as important to teach them uh, about fintech is teaching them financial literacy, something that unfortunately a majority of us seem to lack. So if you see, there's the reports that show that two thirds of the global population are actually financially illiterate. So for us, we are you know, introducing new products, new services, and we get really excited to introduce them. But we tend to forget to make sure to include the educational aspect to that as well. And it's not just about how to use it, but also how they can make positive financial decisions, how they can manage their money, uh, and so on and so forth. And I, I really believe that financial literacy should be included in our educational system, and it shouldn't be treated as an afterthought. Um, in addition to that, uh, financial education actually starts at home because children can start learning basic concepts from as young as three or four years old, and they prefer to learn most of it from their parents. And actually, in fact, by the age of seven, their financial habits and attitudes are pretty much set. So it's really important to start early on. But back to your question about, you know, if we need to incorporate the concepts of, of fintech in education, I think that we should incorporate them in life as educators, parents, and, and society as a whole. You know, things are moving really, really fast, probably 10 times faster than things were changing when we were uh, around that age. So now you have things like crypto, NFTs, metaverse, and God knows what's coming next. So there's so much that we have to catch up on, and I think it should be a given for them. So Dina, if we don't do that, if we don't incorporate it, what are the risks? I think that they risk being behind, uh, falling behind and having to catch up. And, you know, the beauty of it is that, you know, we've seen that Gen Z can actually learn things on their own regardless. They're pretty quick, they're very resourceful, and they will end up learning it. But then the key is, are they learning how to use it responsibly, right? I think at a younger age, when if you incorporate fintech tools that are available as they learn financial education, it's really important. And the best way to do that is through experiential learning, so learning by doing. 
you know, you experience something, then you reflect on it, and then you apply it to your real life. So it's always relevant and it, and it sticks to you. And that's exactly what we do at, at Verity, right? We provide also a controlled environment for parents to make sure that children are learning in a safe environment and they're making their own spending and saving decisions and making mistakes and learning th uh, through them through these kinds of products as well. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So learning by practicing in a safe and, and like in a sandbox kind of an environment where you're monitored, your parents can advise you, they understand your behavior, as you said, at an earlier stage and be able to guide you better in, in, in the way to move forward. So do you mm -hmm. think there are enough awareness platforms out there for kids? So we're not talking about youngsters like 18 plus, but we're talking about kids. I don't think there's enough. And I honestly don't think there can ever be enough the more the merrier and and you know the, the the more you reach different children of different places and different ways the better well i think you just gave everyone a great uh, business opportunity <laughs> so yes, people definitely. out there people out there can actually uh, can actually uh, benefit from this advice and look into this uh, i think untapped uh, vertical if i may call it um, and start um, investing more so um, thank you for the feedback we're moving to our second poll so let me um, let me choose the second question. Okay, here we go. Please engage. Whoa, that was interesting. <laughs> So we have 10 more seconds. If you haven't submitted your answer, please do. Okay, we're done. And for sharing results. So let's look at it. Did the introduction for digital payment create a new opportunity? We have a 54%. Yes, it helped me become financially independent. 30%, 31% uh, no, had no impact, and 15%, yes, it allowed me to open my own business. Okay, um, interesting feedback. So I'm gonna um, stop sharing, and I'm gonna go back um, to my beautiful panelists, and I'm gonna ask you, did you expect that feedback? And I'm uh, gonna start uh, with Zane. I was, um... I was actually expecting the, um, more, I was expecting a higher response on the starting your own business because it did uh, recently, we, we have seen a trend where women are actually leaving their jobs and starting their own businesses. They're becoming more empowered, especially with, um, with, with the remote working and all of that. So that, that's my only, that was the only surprise, I guess, from the poll. Okay, Maha? Uh, yes, Ruba. Uh, actually, to tell you the truth, uh, I think I will go deeper the, the, into this, but uh, to, to, not to save time, uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, fr from the audiences, as we said, that are here, I expected uh, much more on the allowed business part, because I would, uh, I would uh, expect that people that on this uh, seeing us might already have an appetite and already into it, okay? Uh, but also, I, I know that there are a lot of people here just uh, trying to be here to listen and to learn more about it. So that no impact of 30% uh, maybe uh, was a reasonable one for me. So it's, uh, I, I think these, if you take it on a, a bigger scale, they will totally change because we still need uh, to reach people and educate them about this. So it's just because it's a closed loop that we're talking about here that we got the, these rates. Okay, thank you, Maha. Dina? 
Yeah, I agree that I would have expected a larger percent with the starting the own business. I also saw that as a common thing that happened. But also I would, you know, if you allow me to be a bit of the devil's advocate again, do. It, depends, it depends how they define financially independent. Is it that they can actually do their own financial transaction by themselves? Or is it that they've earned a lot to become financially independent? So it's really, I think it's the first, which is great, which just shows more that the adoptions of these digital tools are, you know, being taken up more and more. Um, I would be more interested to hear if it was the latter to see, um, is it, you know, I don't know, investing in crypto and becoming millionaires or selling some <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> We'd love to know more about that. But yes, yeah, we uh, need, we need, we'll need tips for whoever uh, out, uh, is out there. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. So um, just before going to um, the second, uh, our second uh, question. Um, I would like to um, advise that if anyone has a Q&A, please uh, type your question in the Q&A uh, chat box, please. All right, so now we have a question to all of you ladies. Uh, with the disruption that is happening in the world of fintech and the digital acceleration that was an outcome of COVID, right? For the past two years, we've, we've been witnessing this change. What opportunities arise for women from your own like experience and how you've witnessed uh, uh, the things have changed the past two years and how can it impact uh, their uh, financial independence? And this is of course was linked to the question or the poll that was um, shared earlier. Uh, so I would start with you, Maha. Thank you, Ruba. Uh, well, um, I, I love talking about this because I do believe uh, one of the best things that can happen to women is uh, this uh, digital platform. We do understand today that uh, we, we can't be in denial in our region and in Jordan and in, even in the Middle East and in the region. It's, uh, it's a very difficult uh, region for women. From one part, uh, uh, they don't have their financial independency. From another, they have, uh, we, they have to have some tools to work from home because it's not always common for them to go outside home and get jobs. And it's a very, very challenging world for women in that aspect. So especially if we go outside the center of the capitals in all areas. So I do believe that uh, these uh, fintech and digi digital tools have given uh, some aspects to women to, eat, to first, if they want to start small and start from uh, their business from home, they can, which can, uh, as a start, kick off and try a certain business without a lot of cost, uh, especially that these tools are cost effective and they can start with you on a minimal uh, base. So, uh, and, and as you go uh, more and more and bigger, they can also uh, be associated with uh, more two ways payment, collection uh, to, to, for them to receive payments for, from their customers. Uh, it, it also uh, uh, mitigates any geographical barriers, as we said, uh, they can be uh, working and cross-referencing uh, in, in any product they are serving. Uh, uh, they can grow more and more, and even uh, on a more uh, stability of their, as, as, as you mentioned in the poll, in their financial independency. We know this is a big challenge for women uh, in the, the Arab world because uh, to start something and not to divert any income that they, they, that they bring in to, uh, to other uh, unnecessary uh, expenses, they can today focus to keep this within their startup as a business. Uh, saying all this, yes, it's a brilliant tool. I have to say that there's uh, 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 another part that we have to be real about. Today, for this to be really effective and reach women, all of us have a, a very high responsibility to make these tools educate, uh, to reach them, to actually to know about it. So it's a, it's a social responsibility. It's uh, on us as, as fintechs and working the, in this uh, area. Uh, it's also on individuals. It's uh, it's on the government and the, and the different entities, on the NGOs, uh, on support groups, because really to make it effective, they have to know about it, they have to be educated about it, and we have to find ways 
to to eliminate the barrier of fear in, in enrollment of this or uh, using it as uh, money. And lastly, as uh, yes, my banking background kicks in, uh, I know that in any future of any uh, startup, uh, as a woman startups and they want to grow, they will need uh, credit facilities, they will need financial aid. And uh, it will be a much easier way to have records and transactional flows of uh, their, uh, their business to be able to actually uh, be granted uh, such credit. So also it will facilitate an easy way to prove this flow of their business. Uh, I, I, I feel uh, this is perfect. Uh, we all have to chip in and uh, make it reach to, to actually to all uh, startups and micro level and especially to women because of the difficulties that we encounter in this region. Thank you, Maha. Zain, your thoughts? Um, I cannot add much, honestly, after Maha, she's, uh, she covered this um, um, comprehensively. I, maybe the only thing I would like to share is, uh, is um, and something I heard um, particularly in Jordan with mobile wallets. I actually heard that um, straight from a, one of the mobile wallet providers that they, they found that women were thirsty for financial services and um, they really wanted to learn more about them. And one of the key reasons was that they were unable to save. So um, one way to, for them to put money aside was in a mobile wallet because nobody can know about this mobile wallet. So it was a way to hide their money away. It was really interesting and um, inspiring at the same time that we are on, on, the, on the right uh, track and, uh, and on the road to, towards more women empowerment. And uh, knowing that this can actually be done through FinTech is really refreshing and really uh, wonderful. Actually, uh, Zain, you just um, answered uh, one of the questions that, uh, that were asked by the audience. Um, the fact that digital wallets are out there means that women don't need to go to banks. They don't need um, any approvals from anyone, husbands, um, family, whatever it is. And we know the, the sometimes the culture is, 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 uh, is, uh, is um, not as accepting as, as we'd like it to be, uh, for women especially. So I guess you, you just highlighted a very, very important point is the opportunity for women to have just opened their, their, their actually uh, digital wallets from their mobile. Uh, and they can uh, and can help them whether do like their own financial services or open up um, a business and so forth. And so thank you for that, Dina. Sure. So I mean, again, Zain and, and Maha spoke uh, comprehensively about women, but if you uh, you allow me, I'd like to speak about it from a children's perspective and how they were affected through their moms and their dads and during this time. So generally when it comes to young children, I don't think there's a huge difference from a gender perspective, except maybe in the rural areas, as you mentioned previously, when they got more access to internet, and maybe education and other tools at that time. But in general, there are a number of things that um, I would say affected children in different ways. So during the pandemic, there's many parents who lost their jobs uh, or they were worried to lose their jobs, right? And there was this full uncertainty about the overall situation, which could lead many families to rethink their spending decisions and their overall financial situations. And I think that created the opportunity for many parents to start speaking to their children about money and finances, right? And as we shifted more towards e-commerce and you know we're not using cash anymore and having to buy things online, it also gave parents more of an opportunity to instill different financial values in their kids and have these types of conversations about watching what we spend, becoming more money conscious and maybe even how credit cards work, right? So. At the same time, uh, we also saw a lot of kids who started their own at-home project and start selling things on Instagram. And here in Jordan, I saw plenty. I saw a few in Dubai that I was able to access to my Instagram account. So that also started like an entrepreneurial spark within them and started them thinking about how to create businesses and things that they can do. And also with the rise of digital payments um, and cashless transactions, and as they grew, now many are looking at, okay, so how do we include children in this transformation, right? There's so many that are focusing on children just like we are, and how can we avail these kind of digital tools and start the process early and teach them uh, from that point on. And 
You know, when it comes to girls, so since we were focusing on women, I want to talk about girls a little bit. So they sometimes get left out from the financial education process, right? And a lot of times that's either driven by culture or just unintentional bias that could happen from parents. Um, and so because the pandemic has disproportionately hurt women in, in so many different ways that we've spoken about, but if we make sure to really focus on teaching young girls better ma management skills, uh, they would be, be in a stronger position in the future, God forbid, if they had to face something, a situation like the pandemic itself, and they can become more flexible and agile with more choices for them so that they, be, they can become more financially resilient. I love that, Dina. And actually, mm -hmm. because we're addressing um, the region, and um, I think in most of the Arab countries, we have the same culture, the same lifestyle, um, the, the same... Uh, um, the way they look at women and the way they um, uh, they actually and, and you said it uh, quite well the the way we're looked at even at, uh, at a very young age what is allowed what is not allowed uh, what kind of independence you may or may not have and and this is why it's quite important to um, uh, utilize technology in a way to really uh, give not equality, equity to everyone, right? It's all about equity and giving the same opportunity um, to all. And one of the key things that I love in uh, today that is being offered uh, through through banks and uh, I believe also through uh, digital wallets is the personal financial manager that allows you even like at, at an early age or even like as an adult to be able to manage your transactions in a better way, to be able to plan ahead of time. We, we, we tend not to plan, we tend to spend and we don't even know where we're spending, what is the largest per, um, percentage of our spendings go. So uh, with personal financial managers, you're able to understand, well, I spend mostly on fashion or uh, I don't know, at a retail outlet or uh, traveling. And it also allows you to uh, save money right for a, uh, for a goal and i think these these tools are quite important uh, because again i'll go back to what dina said because when you're more aware you understand your behavior uh, in a better manner then you're able to understand risks more you're able to build your business in a in a in a more professional manner and you wouldn't have to go through uh, a lot of um, of the, the the big mess that we might uh, do if we don't have a, uh, enough awareness and understanding. So now we'll move to our next poll. Okay, here we go, audience. Whoever is not participating, go ahead and participate. We'd love to get your feedback. Five more seconds to go. Okay, I'm ending the poll. There we go. Let me share the results. So the question was, do you believe that the transformation in the fintech um, uh, industry created competition between banks and fintech companies? And the answers are, as you see, yes, banks transform because of the pressure of new fintech startups, that like 73%. Uh, no, it created a form of collaboration which, open, uh, which will open uh, new uh, business doors. And the third was no new services will pop up due to this uh, transformation. So that was the least the 7%. So I'm gonna um, stop sharing and get my panelists um, uh, insight. Maha, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Riba. Uh, of course, first of all, uh, at the arising of the fintech uh, world uh, put a lot of uh, the banks in, uh, in a direction that they have to move into the digital world uh, because the future is all about 
fintechs and digital payments. So if they don't actually uh, ride the wave, they will be left behind. Saying this, so I am with the 73%. However, I do feel that there are a lot of room to, to collaborate between banks and fintechs because if we want uh, the ecosystem to be uh, equipped well and to go into this uh, with the proper formation, I do believe it has to be uh, all together. So uh, I would actually would have given uh, the second uh, one more of value than the 20% uh, because today we not in the near future we can eliminate banks. So it will be much better off if we can collaborate together to facilitate to people better channels as well, because we know that the banks are widely spread in, in any country. So we can build on that. And they can also build on the accessibility and the easier form that the fintechs can reach people with a lighter uh, form and an easier access point to the usually unbanked sector. Thank you, Maha. Dina? Yeah, I'm absolutely not surprised with this result at all. <laughs> Banks, I think in general have FOMO. So the new technologies or the new things that fintechs are doing is something like we should be doing that. We need to be doing everything. But like Maha said, I think the collaboration is a, is a good way to go in most cases. Um, and so, yeah, it didn't really surprise me that much, but there's other driving factors too, like you said, right, the needs of youth, the needs of Gen Z, um, the gig economy, entrepreneurs and whatnot. So I think it's a mix of both. Okay, uh, Zayn? I wasn't surprised either, and um, Diana, Dina and I have, have actually had so many conversations on this because uh, I'm a personal advocate of fintech, and I really believe that uh, without this collaboration, without collaboration between banks, um, definitely banks would would be missing out on on a lot because fintechs are, will always be more agile than banks, will always be more progressive, and um, instead of competing, we should we should definitely partner with fintechs. Perfect. So we're promoting collaboration. So let me jump to our um, uh, second part of our question flow. Maha, um, having financial institutions always monitored by central banks in the region with extremely heavy regulations, maybe in certain countries more than others, uh, do you see that as a hurdle for the fintech industry to grow in the Middle East? And uh, let's start with that uh, answer. Yes. Uh, well, actually, in general, I am in support of having uh, central bank regulations to, su to support safe environment for the fintechs, businesses, and individuals. However, as we know in the world, uh, this space is all about innovation. So, uh, yes, it, it has to be in a minimal form to, to leave space for this innovation to, to explore itself and expand. As uh, you may know that today we have around 330 fintechs in the Arab world alone. And we can see that, for example, Bahrain and UAE, in, in, in our uh, Arab world, they are much more advanced. And I do feel that a big part of uh, that is the ease and, uh, and the, of the regulation and giving them the space, uh, of course, with, uh, with some... Uh, benchmark and some uh, details that I have to kick in because it's a financial uh, tool and there's uh, cash in it and there's money spent and uh, the protection of people. But uh, yes, if there, if there was no actual uh, ease, it will restrict uh, heavily. And that will also put any uh, country uh, as a follower rather than being more um, on the lead and uh, being able to be uh, as a hub, as we know, for example, Jordan was a hub for uh, IT in, in uh, outside. But with, with these restrictions, it can't be because it will be more of a follower rather than a leader. So Maha, if you're, uh, you're to advise <laughs> regulators, not only in Jordan, but in the region, what do you think needs to change yes. for things um, to move forward? Uh, actually, um, for central banks, uh, first of all, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of sandbox uh, scenarios that has been uh, regulatory sandbox that has been there. However, I feel these should be more effective, uh, more activated, and maybe more uh, with interaction uh, with the fintech space. Like there should be some committees 
to brainstorm and uh, know more about the real life and what are the burdens that we can face today and what would stop us or accelerate. And another actually belief that I have is uh, they have to push uh, open banking. And, and, and that's a big thing for everybody because uh, for banks and having fintechs as well within that because you have to have uh, the means for fintechs to have the banking data as well, not only for banks. So if, if you want to move forward, as, uh, as we always take uh, the lessons learned from uh, more developed uh, areas, we do have to have it to go into open banking. Thank you. So you're, you're uh, making us jump to our, our next question, but honestly, one of the key things that I feel um, technology provides is bridging, uh, bridging the gap between the, the, the uh, Arab countries, at least, I'm not going to go to the global, but at least between us in, in the region and, and uh, going beyond the borders, right, and being able to collaborate with each other. And um, one of the main verticals is, uh, is, is, is the financial um, uh, vertical. So uh, having said that, uh, moving on to Zain, um, Zain Open Banking and Maha touched um, on that has been constitutionalized in the UK and Europe since 2018. Uh, would you first, before we kickstart uh, our, our second part of the question, define what open banking is so everyone is aligned? Yes, of course. Um, of course, uh, open banking as a topic, we can uh, we can have a separate session on that. But uh, just in very, very simple terms for those who are unfamiliar with it, uh, let's first not mix up open banking regulations with the concept of open banking, because we hear a lot about uh, uh, PSD2 in, in, U in Europe and, and UK open banking regulations. Open banking in, in, in by, by definition is simply for banks to expose their services and their data to third parties. Um, this enables uh, uh, third parties, mainly fintechs and other, other third party uh, uh, solution providers to make use of, uh, of information that is already and data that is already available to banks in order to deliver value to customers. So a very simple example, just to, to bring this closer to reality, um, there's a there's an app called Mint. Uh, Mint basically consolidates all of all of your banking uh, all of your bank accounts in, in one place. So for Mint to be able to provide this solution to customers, it would need to directly integrate with every bank. In the absence of open banking regulations, it would have to do this directly. Where you have open banking regulations mandating that every bank exposes its services then Mint would be able to simply integrate with all of these banks, and it would always require the customer's consent, of course. So I'm a customer, I use a Mint app, I have to consent to retrieve my data, and then I can view all of my, my uh, accounts in one place. This is just one example of one service. Of course, it applies to all other FinTech services. So um, Zay, what opportunity arises from deploying open banking in the, in the Middle East region? Um, Unfortunately, it is usually perceived as something that benefits fintechs only uh, because it puts a lot of pressure on traditional banks uh, for them to, to, to invest in technology, to, to, to transform, to be able to expose their services. However, it, again, because I'm an advocate of, of partnership with fintechs, we can look at the, of the other side of the coin as well as banks and, and see that there is always value that can be extracted from this partnership. So it shouldn't be, um, uh, um, it shouldn't be perceived as something negative being pushed down our throat, but rather something that we should leverage and make use of in order to, to benefit. It, it, of course, open banking, uh, it reshapes the whole uh, competitive landscape of banking. It, um, it improve cust improves customer experience because it delivers value, not only through banks, and most importantly, it, um, it uh, delays uh, or it creates networks as opposed to centralization of financial services with banks. So it's really key. It's a key driving force of innovation in any country. So where are we in the Middle East from open banking? In, in the Middle East, uh, basically, um, Bahrain was the first to adopt uh, uh, open banking regulations um, and followed by Saudi. Um, uh, creating a policy for that, not regulations. Uh, they have a, a, a very big plan for implementation of open banking, which also aligns with their 2030 plans. Everybody's looking at Saudi uh, uh, 
uh, and what they're doing, which is extremely interesting. Of course, UAE has always been also a pioneer in, in everything digital um, and, um, and is following and it's expected as well to launch, uh, to issue uh, open banking regulations in UAE soon. Um, uh, as for other countries, of course, every regulator in the Middle East and maybe in the world is considering that. So each within the, their own uh, uh, um, priorities, but it's, it's happening. Okay, very good to know. Dina. So now you put everything together, uh, Dina, uh, by uh, touching on, on uh, two points, actually, we've, we've just talked about. It's uh, competition versus collaboration between uh, uh, banks and, uh, and, and fintech, and, um, and also uh, putting it together when we talk about open banking and the opportunity, because as Zain mentioned, it, it, it actually, it's an opportunity not only for fintech, but also for, for banks. So give us your advice. <laughs> Advice. Well, so, I mean, it's always, this is the question that's been lingering on so many people's minds, right? Who's going to win? Is it the banks or is it the fintechs and whatnot? So from my perspective, I think that both can try doing it alone, but in reality, they both need each other in one way or another, right? So you have the banks who are generally, who are still more traditional, they're highly regulated, they're built on legacy systems. They're used to address things in a certain systemic way when it comes to their customers. And, but they also have still some, you know, uh, to some extent, the credibility and high trust factor from, from people. And then the fintechs, on the other hand, they're generally more innovative, they're more in touch with their customers, more agile, and they become really, really good at whatever it is that they do. But fin fintechs need banks' open APIs and there's the access that we were talking about in the open banking and the back end. And banks, I believe, need fintechs' um, their agility, innovation, and the understanding also of the younger generation. So the key is really what's that formula of working together and what is it going to look like? Or, or is it that they're going to spend so much time trying to do certain things on their own and it's not going to be as efficient? Uh, so I believe that collaborations really happen because fintechs are so focused and they get good at what they do and banks want to access new markets and customers, right? And what banks doesn't want to get uh, potential new revenue streams as well. And they're more mass than fintechs. So it's good to be able to access such niche, mar niche markets. So if they both decide to focus on things that they do and they collaborate, the, the key is that if they collaborate, they actually bring the best products and services and user experience to the consumer at the end. And that's what really we should all be striving to do at the end. Perfect. So um, collaborate, yes, compete to bring in the best service uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the client eventually. So um, I'm gonna um, wrap up uh, our session with our last question. And this question is uh, to all the panelists. So we've, we've talked a lot about trends, uh, we've talked about hurdles, we've talked about challenges, regulations. So what do we expect next? What new financial services will pop up uh, within the coming year or two. Um, Maha, give us a one minute uh, feedback, please. Well, uh, yes, Ruba, uh, I do believe this will drill down to a lot of products, whether from uh, uh, businesses, uh, they can use this to reach people, for example, for payroll, as, as we know, everybody has the right uh, to get uh, their salary, whether they're banked or unbanked, or whether whatever geographical area or, uh, or cultural beliefs and so on. So this can be really expedited to a lot of levels because it's a much needed, as you know, today in all areas, uh, uh, we have to kick in this to better uh, the, the rate of people reaching the, any financial uh, tool. So I, I do believe that's a big thing. On another note for individuals, I do believe uh, this uh, is basically a trend that uh, all families should adopt because it's an easy tool not only to reach uh, their, their children in financial uh, support or, uh, or transfer for them. It's also a, way, a means to, 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 to see what are the, their, where are they transacting, they can control where they can actually pay or spend. So I do feel on, on one level from the business side, it's more into that. And from a retail, it's on the families and, and their children. Thank you, Zain. Final thoughts. 
um, I don't have expectations per se, but I am uh, I'm in in the lookout to see what how artificial intelligence is going to to kick in. It has already, of course, but but how it will unfold, as well as this whole um, crypto e e NFTs okay. world. Okay. Now yeah, it's a big uh, thing. NFT. It's a big yeah. thing. So uh, <laughs> how how it's going to turn out to really uh, where you can extract value from that? Um, I'm yet to see. So that's that's my final. But that's thought. great. We're we're putting an opportunity out there, Dina. Sure. So I think we might see the lines blur regarding what uh, the definition of what an actual startup is in terms of the industry, right? So from fintech's perspective, Rarity is a fintech. We're moving a bit more into edtech. So it might be a blur of a fintech edtech kind of uh, thing. We also might see more consolidation between the different types of fintechs. You're seeing more and more and more uh, come up. Maybe some of them might join forces or become, you know, got by, bought out by bigger companies. But we also have seen the emergence of uh, what we call super apps, right? These apps that really create um, an environment where people can do multiple things in the same in the same place, and that really creates the utmost convenience for its users. So, and 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 then they become a one one stop shop for many things within one app, uh, rather than you keep switching apps. Uh, I think in terms of uh, customer focus, I think you'll see more and more focus on children and the younger generation as uh, definitely is starting to happen and potentially also more focused on women, maybe personal finance and investment tools focused on women. And we've seen that happen in the Western world. And I think maybe in our part of the world, that's a bit lagging to catch up. Well, and would like to see more venture capitalists, women venture capitalists, right? To support women in the region. And I think that would bring a lot of value add. Women support women. Uh, women um, deal more comfortably sometimes with women. So it's not about eliminating men. It's about um, increasing the opportunity out there for more women startups, more women-based businesses, and uh, investments in, 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 in women uh, startups. And we would like to see women unicorns, right? Uh, hopefully from the region. Um, I'm going to give the audience one minute in case anyone wants to type one final question before we end our session. So uh, we, the question that was previously posted was answered actually by, by, by Zane. But if uh, there are any final thoughts from the audience. Let me just check. So I guess, uh, I guess we're good to go. Thank you so much, ladies. I personally learned a lot from you. I hope the audience also benefited. Next, uh, next event, I hope uh, we find more women um, uh, owned businesses out there in the, in the FinTech industry. Uh, thank you again and uh, good luck to all. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.